Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425. We have the jobless claims report. They're down slightly over the last couple of weeks. Uh, has a lot to do with the payroll protection program. Uh, 30 million jobs saved by PPP. Still not enough. Uh, speaking of PPP, I might as well go on out of the gate with this jobless claims number coming in and remind you, if you need help uh, getting into PPP, go to FirstLibertyGA.com. Um, I, I wasn't going to do this out of the gate, but it is relevant. As the jobless claims come in, there are still now um, 2.981 million unemployment claims last week. Uh, during the last eight weeks, 36 million unemployment claims. Uh, the worst ever in the country, and uh, it would have been even far worse but for PPP, the government uh, essentially taking over the payroll of small businesses. If you want into the program, go to FirstLibertyGA.com, FirstLibertyGA.com. That's First Liberty uh, Building and Loan. They're in Noonan, Georgia. They can help you wherever you are in the nation, but they're local to me. I know the Frost family that runs them. They've been doing this since 1993, helping small businesses, and they can help you get into PPP. You need to get your payroll in order. They can't guarantee it, but they'll do their best and you can apply on their website. You don't even have to call them. So firstlibertyga.com. I want to get into all that in the Flynn stuff. KT McFarland is going to join me at the bottom of the hour. We we have the leaks uh, of of names of people who unmasked Mike Flynn. Now, these aren't the leakers. I shouldn't say that. Uh, The people who unmasked Mike Flynn. Now, there are a couple of things you need to know for perspective. Unmasking is when uh, what happens is with it within intelligence, you have a foreign national who is talking to an American citizen. The intelligence community that intercepts the information, in this case, uh, with the Russian ambassador Kislyak uh, talking to an American, when you have that information, uh, the American is covered up, redacted from the report. And that has happened for years. It happened well before Barack Obama became president. And what happens is when uh, someone who is authorized can request that the American be unmasked, um, it is not supposed to be to satisfy their own curiosity. It's supposed to be if there's a concern. So there is a concern within the Obama administration, which, by the way, has done more unmasking than any prior administration. And there are apparently up to 14 different people within the Obama administration, including uh, Joe Biden and Barack Obama and others, wanted Mike Flynn's name unmasked. Uh, So they unmasked his name from the report. They found out it was Mike Flynn that Kislyak was talking to. Uh, it, It seems most probable that they saw someone engaged with Kislyak talking about altering the relationship between the United States and Russia. And if you keep in mind, by this point, the Obama administration believes the worst about the Trump administration, believes the worst about the Trump campaign, and really does believe by this point that the Trump campaign is somehow uh, being controlled by the Russians. This is the Democrats completely believed this. It, it turns out not to be true, but the Democrats believed it. So they believe that the Trump administration or the incoming Trump administration is completely controlled by the uh, Russians. Uh, They see someone, they don't know who, talking to Kislyak about realigning the American-Russian relationship. They want him unmasked, and surprise, it begins to leak to members of the media that Mike Flynn has done this. Barack Obama is so concerned about it, uh, he goes to the Department of Justice to Sally Yates. Sally Yates, in turn, ultimately winds up telling the new vice president, uh, Mike Pence, that Mike Flynn had lied to Mike Pence. And by the way, it's true. Mike Flynn lied to Mike Pence. That is objectively true. He lost his job because he lied to the vice president. But all of the information about Flynn began to leak because the Obama administration presumed the worst about the Trump campaign and Donald Trump and his incoming administration. They really did believe that the Trump campaign was coordinating with the Russians. And we know from the Flynn, from the Mueller inquiry, that's not true. I, I, I gotta, I, I really do need to do this. I, I need to go back to this audio from yesterday for uh, Brian Stetler on CNN, 
who is blasting Republicans for being obsessed about the Russia situation. Uh, the, the Washington Free Beacon put this away, but it, it put this together. But you got to remember how obsessed the Democrats were, Brian Steltler was, with the Russia investigation. So disappointing to look at what we're seeing from right-wing media these days, where there's such an obsession with the deep state and these uh, revelations about the Russia pro. <laughs> The latest on the Robert Mueller Russia investigation. Mueller investigation. The Russian investigation. Trump's Russia ties. And Robert Mueller. The real Russia story. Russia probe. The ongoing Russia probes. Russia probe. The Russian investigation. But Mueller and the Russia probe. Russia synergies. They wonder if Russia has compromising information on the president. What is the source for the president's claim that they have found no collusion with Russia? He misspelled collusion. Every day we're trying to keep track of the drip, drip, drip of the Russia investigation. Drip, 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 Trump and Russia to see whether Trump was secretly working for Russia. To bring it back to Russia and Russia and Russia, 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 Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller, special counsel, Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller, Mueller investigation, Mueller report, Russia conspiracy. Do you believe that he's colluding with Russia? I wish I could just say no. He's definitely not. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, uh, putting that in proper perspective for you. Talk about uh, no sense of self-awareness there. Now, here's the thing. I, I honestly, I have never talked, spent a lot of time on the Flynn stuff. I've never really cared about it. Uh, I've never been a Mike Flynn fan. Uh, and uh, KT McFarland's going to join me at the bottom of the hour. She worked for him. She likes him. I, I know a number of people who've liked him. I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I never particularly did. Um, and, and I know part of that is just uh, him being in the military and then coming at being so aggressively partisan. It always struck me very much like James Comey and Andrew McCabe coming in. And it turns out they are the left wing hacks you always thought they were. Um, and I, I just say, and yeah, Mike Flynn's on, on our side and, and he's a conservative. But I don't know. There's just something institutionally about me seeing people in the military coming out and immediately being so rapidly partisan. Uh, and, and that has always bothered me, and, and th- that's more on me than him. But nonetheless, I, I, it's not something I kept up with. But I do think it is very notable, regardless, that members of the Obama administration benefited from the unmasking. They leaked and disparaged Mike Flynn. They leaked and disparaged Donald Trump. They leaked and disparaged the administration. They got the entire media spun up on the idea that the Russians were navigating the Trump administration, the Russians were controlling the Trump administration. And even after the Mueller investigation, They still did that. Even after the Mueller investigation, the Democrats still kept spinning up about uh, Mike Flynn and about the Russians controlling Donald Trump and Donald Trump being a Russian hatchet man who are a Russian apparatchik put into the White House and all of the deals with Russia that Trump wanted to do. And it was all Russia, Russia, Russia for the Democrats. And now suddenly they're like, oh, it's the GOP. They're obsessed. You guys were obsessed with it for three years until Robert Mueller told you there was no there there. And then you were still obsessed with it until you could move on to something else to try to get the president. The only reason they're so uh, over the Russia stuff is because of the virus. The moment the virus goes away, they'll be back to the Russia stuff. They'll be wondering if Donald Trump and the Russians made the virus. The thing that gets me, though, on this Russia situation is that um, these people for years leaked this information. John Brennan is on there. Uh, Susan Rice is on there. Barack Obama is on there. Uh, Joe Biden is on there. Uh, there are a number of names on there, uh, and a number of those people are sources. And we also now know that some of those people went on television and mouthed off as experts saying bad stuff was coming related to Russia, and then under oath to Adam Schiff's committee said, oh, they don't really have any of this information. That's just what they were saying on TV when they were behind closed doors and put under oath. And it's remarkable that Republicans never leaked that stuff. It's remarkable how Adam Schiff and the Democrats benefited for years from leaks about the from the Obama team, about the Trump team. The media circulated those leaks as gospel truth, and the Republicans never engaged in a willful campaign to leak back. And I, I actually suspect the Republicans tried. I, I don't actually think the Republican motives are pure here. I don't think they have halos either. I, I think they tried to leak, and the media didn't want to pick up the Republican leaks because it did no good. The Republicans had to go to Fox and say this stuff. They could couldn't go to CNN or MSNBC, which was profiting in ratings terms, in monetary terms, from the leaks from the Democrats to make Donald Trump look bad because their network viewers don't like Donald Trump. 
But it's really, really disingenuous to watch the Democrats today out there leaking and to watch the Democrats out there today screaming that this was a public unveiling of the unmaskers. It was a public unmasking of the unmaskers. How about that? There's a word choice there. A public unmasking of the unmaskers. It wasn't a leak. Would they have preferred it to be a leak? I'm assuming at this point that's their complaint because they've been leaking this stuff for years. And it wasn't a it wasn't a, a leak response to them. It was a a public unveiling. And they're outraged by the public unveiling. They think it undermines national security. No, what undermines national security is you taking advantage of the unmasking and smearing everyone. And then being outraged when you are unmasked as one of those people who wanted to unmask the person who spoke. These people have spent years undermining the Trump administration, and they really resent like hell that the Trump administration is now playing their game against them. They really don't like it. You know, it it reminds me of kids on the playground where you've got the kid who is dominant and suddenly the other kids figure out a strategy and they turn the tables on him. And instead of trying to up his game or change things, he just takes the football and goes home. He he takes his ball and goes home. He screams and cries and gets mad at him. That's what happened with the Obama kids. You know, uh, you've got the the Tommy Veter kid who worked for the Obama administration, who was a, a bus driver ahead of times. You've got Ben Rhodes, who got a degree in creative writing, who was a spokesman for the National Security Council, who openly admitted to lying to reporters to get them to sell the Iran deal. They resent like hell that Donald Trump has been able to roll back so much of the Obama administration's agenda so quickly. It took eight years for Barack Obama to put that stuff together, and Donald Trump has rolled it back in less than four. And they don't like it. And they've used every trick they could to try to undermine him, including advancing a Russian narrative against the president. And now many of those people have been exposed as people who requested the information about Mike Flynn. And again, to be clear here, to be fair, this happens a lot. Unmasking happens a lot. But I really don't think, as as much as I don't care about the overall situation, I do care that a bunch of people benefited by leaks to a sympathetic press and are now outraged that they've been outed. I do care that it does now appear that the sole purpose for outing Mike Flynn was to smear the Trump administration because we now know from Bob Mueller himself that there's no there there in the Russia allegations. They built up this narrative for three years. It led ultimately to the impeachment of the president. And it turns out there was never a there there with Russia. And sure, they can say, well, no, this this is a, this is all he was impeached over the Ukraine call. But that was all tied to the Russia stuff The the president's responses are best explained as being angry about the, the Democrats in Russia. And the president believing the Ukraines had engaged in in some way to help the Democrats get information from Russia that wasn't true. It all all roads do come back to Russia. And for Brian Settler and and people on TV to say, oh, I can't believe the Republicans are so obsessed with this Russia deep state stuff. You're the people who've been obsessed with it for three years, you hypocrite. That you lack so much self-awareness that you can't even see it. And now you've been exposed and you're squalling about it. I really have no sympathy for the people who've been unmasked as serial unmaskers just so they could drive an agenda in the press without any pushback from the Trump administration. It's me. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I'm, I was going to start the show with it, but then decided to go with the Flint. you know, I do this on the fly. I shake everything up. Um, my poor team of people around me, they they ne- they know never to actually advertise what I'm going to start with because by the time I get here, uh, it's completely different from what I told them I was going to do. Um, I will get, though, to the IHME modeling. Let me give you some good news about Georgia, though. I want to spend more time with this, but I do want to give you the good news. Uh, the, the IHME model is the model that the White House relies on. It's the model that Brian Kemp relies on. It's the model that all the other 49 governors rely on and a lot of uh, outside organizations and healthcare professionals rely on. 
And if you will recall, after Brian Kemp opened the state of Georgia up, the IHME model spiked. Uh, The number of projected deaths went up. The number of projected cases went up. The number of projected hospitalizations went up. It did not look good for the governor. Now, the thing that did not uh, ever, ever max out was hospital space. And that was the governor's argument that the we would have enough hospital capacity. And that was always what flattening the curve was about. Flatten the curve, uh, get enough PPP, enough ventilators or PPE, enough ventilators, enough hospital beds so that we could handle any surge in cases. That's what flattening the curve was. We got to that point. We can now get out of our houses with precautions, wear masks. The governor again this week has said, you got to wear a mask when you go into crowded places. You got to wear a mask. You got to be safe. You got to wash your hands. Avoid touching your, your eyes and nose area. Well, the IHME model has revised again, dramatically downward. Let me put this in perspective for you, and this is is news you should be encouraged by. Two days ago, the IHME model showed that in Georgia, by June 12th, there would be 1,783 new daily cases on June 12th of COVID-19, And we would not get to zero cases until sometime after August. In fact, in July, July 1st, there would still be about 1,000 new daily cases. They've revised the model now. On June 12th, the model shows that instead of the 1,783 new daily cases projected, there will be 367. And by July 1st, there will be less than 100 daily cases, and by August, there will be zero cases in Georgia. Essentially, uh, zeroing out COVID-19 by July instead of closer to Labor Day in the model revisions. Now, I I will have you know, I talked to a couple of different people, and uh, that model changed yesterday. And the people I talked to close to the governor's office said they thought it was notable that there was a rush of reporters who called after the governor uh, reopened the state and the model shifted so dramatically towards the negative, and there haven't been any calling to ask about why the model had a major downward shift. In fact, I checked the Atlanta Journal-Constitution this morning, and I can't find a big celebratory story about the model shifting. Why is that exactly? By the way, you know, Governor Jared Polis of Colorado reopened the state of Colorado uh, in the same way Georgia reopened the state of Georgia at the same time. Turns out that Colorado has uh, is testing fewer people per thousand than Georgia. Where's the media outrage about that? I, I, I got to wonder if the D next to his name has something to do with it. I mean, I, I, I think that that's a reasonable hypothesis is that because Jared Polis is a Democrat, the media is willing to give him a pass, which further undermines the media. It's like the Mike Flynn stuff. The media was vastly more willing to listen to Democrats claim that Donald Trump was colluding with Russia than listen to Republicans who said he wasn't. The media was vastly more likely to listen to the Democrats going on TV saying that uh, there was a there there than they were to Republicans who were telling them, hey, no, actually, they said under oath that behind closed doors that there was no there there. Because we now know from the leaked transcripts of, of the House hearings that the very same Democrats who were going on MSNBC and CNN saying that uh, there was going to be big news coming were saying behind the scenes under oath to the House of Representatives. No, actually, I was just saying that on TV. We, we know that. That's there in the record now. Notice how the media is not covering that side of it. Notice how they're not holding accountable their own side. You know, take salt. You know what salt is? The the state and local taxes. State and local taxes. You used to be able to uh, you deduct those from your income, federal income tax, and now you can't. And it's driven up taxes in New York, California, Illinois. CNN has been beside itself. Its anchors have been beside themselves in covering this, that that it's an injustice. How much different do you think CNN's coverage would be if it was still headquartered in Atlanta? I mean, it purportedly is, uh, but almost all of their anchors, I think all of their anchors now are in New York and D.C. It's amazing that when you're in New York and Washington, how your perspective skews on everything 
maybe we need a new national network that's not located there and see if we can get a different perspective on the world. It is Eric Erickson here across the state of Georgia. The phone number 877-97-ERIC-877-973-7425. Uh, one of the best of the best when it comes to national security out there who worked for some of the best of the best, going all the way back to the Reagan administration and, uh, man, uh, so involved in uh, shaping some of the Reagan policies uh, through her work as a speechwriter in the Defense Department and then uh, into the national security apparatus and just a true patriot. Katie McFarlane, who happens to be joining me on the phone. How are you? Well, I'm just great, Eric. Thank you very much for having me. So, you know, I, I, I wish I had you on the line, although you had, would have had to wait and hear the whole thing. I was talking about the, the Mike Flynn situation earlier, who you worked for uh, in yeah. the White House for a short time. And I, I think it's just interesting that so many of the Barack Obama administration officials who benefited from leaks to the media are so outraged that Republicans didn't leak a list of unmaskers, but actually held a press conference and announced the names of those people. Uh, I, I guess they would have been happier if the information leaked on Fox or something. <laughs> Look, they, they, the workaround that the Obama administration did, and they did it pretty consistently, and they certainly did it during the transition into the Trump administration with General Flynn, is the intelligence community would leak to their favorite people in the media. And it would always be quoted as anonymous sources or people close to the situation who were unable to speak about this publicly. And then they would just go on and spin whatever they wanted. These were unverified. These were un, you know, unidentified people. And in a, a number of cases, they were using classified information. I mean, there, for example, the big thing that everybody's talking about now, Eric, is the phone call between General Flynn and the Russian ambassador right before Inauguration Day. And so the transcript of that has leaked, and it leaked at the time, a couple of days after the phone call. It leaked where? To the Washington Post. General Flynn has still not seen the transcript. I've not seen the transcript. I doubt if anybody has seen the transcript outside of the intelligence community and some reporters at the Washington Post and New York Times. Well, it, what's striking to me is is the arrogance of some of the in the Obama administration that uh, the incoming president and his transition team was somehow not allowed to have communication with foreign leaders and and get comfortable with them and and explain the differences in direction they might want to go. And it, it seems like most of the complaining from the Obama administration is that it took them eight years to put something together, and uh, this president, to his credit, has largely eradicated it in less than four. Yeah, I mean, look, they, if, a, if an incoming administration is not talking to its counter, counterparts abroad, that's malpractice. Because right. you sure don't want to come in at 12.01 on Inauguration Day and say, uh, I'm looking for the phone number for the, you know, the president of Turkey. We've got a crisis here. You need to establish those relationships during a transition. That's what a transition is for. And so their, their complaint that, well, General Flynn should not have talked to the Russian ambassador, that's false on, on its very face. But what, why were they complaining? Why are they doing this? Why? Because they had set out from the very beginning of the Trump, right after the election, to try to hobble President Trump in office because he promised to drain the swamp. He promised to go after corrupt government officials. He promised to look into the intelligence community and reorganize it. And he promised to cut the fat. They didn't want that to happen. This, these were preemptive strikes. And the excuse they used was the Russia hoax. And they knew and they testified before Congress in closed session that they knew there was nothing to the collusion story. And yet to the media and to the American public, they said, oh, yeah, this is really serious. Donald Trump must be a Russian asset. And they put us through three years of division and getting at each other's throats over nothing because they well, were so angry about Donald Trump winning. I, I don't know if you, you've seen this montage from the Washington Free Beacon they put up yesterday, Brian Settler on CNN, who is now just beside himself that Republicans seem obsessed about uh, Russia and the deep state oh, yeah. <laughs> after three years of, of obsession. It, it just, it, you know, I do wonder if, if some of their concern is that it, it turns out the reset button that Hillary Clinton gave the Russians had broken and, and they just are hoping no one ever realizes it. <laughs> Well, they were doing, you know, but this is serious. It was the intelligence community working with the American media, with the partisan American media, the Washington Press Corps, to try to create and spin this entire lie on the American people. So I think the press should be held responsible for it. I'm not going to listen to those guys and take them seriously ever again. They were peddling stuff that was not true. 
Well, and you know, I, I so I pointed out uh, right before you came on uh, in, in my last segment. Uh, when you take, for example, the even the COVID nineteen stuff, the uh, Brian Kemp here in Georgia and Jared Paulus in Colorado opened their states at the same time. The media never said anything about Jared Paulus. They made the attack on Georgia about testing, and it turns out Georgia per capita is testing way more people on a daily basis than Colorado. But you've never heard the media attack Paulus, who happens to have a D next to his name. <laughs> it's you know it's, they've really just America has the First Amendment of the United States is supposed to be free speech and what are these guys doing in the media, the partisan media? There's nothing about free speech in this. They're doing what they want. They're acting like a, another wing of the Democrat Party or a wing of the Obama administration. And so you know I, I know President Trump well, and I've got to say I give him an enormous amount of respect for the fact that he's not only had to de- battle the Democrats in the House of Representatives. And he's had to battle some of the Republicans who are angry that they didn't get to be president. But he's also had the press stacked against him. Something like 97 percent of all media stories are anti-Trump. Right. Well, you know, that that's a perfect transition into I know you've got a book coming out. Uh, I think it was, is it's Revolution, Trump, Washington and, and We the People. Tell me about that. Bestseller on Amazon, so you can, <laughs> your listeners can just click on the link right now and start downloading it. And they can listen to the audio book and they can have much more of my voice singing into their ears. <laughs> Perfect. Or they can actually buy the book, the hardcover book. It's, look, I wrote it in three parts. The first part was why I, a uh, longtime Republican establishment foreign policy expert, really said that the Republican Party had gone in the wrong, the wrong direction and I supported Trump. A lot of it was because he, he would fix the economy and he would stand up to China. None of those other guys would stand up to China, Republican or Democrat. The second part of the book is my own experiences in Washington and setting up the Trump administration, but also in great detail about the topic we've just discussed, which is the Mueller investigation, the Russia investigation, my experiences with it, which were very similar to General Flynn's, you know, ambushing, trying to pin crimes on you that you didn't commit. And then the final part was um, I was so fed up with all that was going on in Washington that my husband and I just left the country for months. To try, and I was trying to make sense of it. So we went to the most remote part of Western Scotland. No Wi-Fi, no TV, no cell phone, no nothing. Oh, and man, I, I'm jealous. And, well, it was a good time for me because I got my feet under myself again. And I started thinking, what's going on in my country? And I realized, hey, America goes through revolutions. We're supposed to go through political revolutions. It's the way that we, the people who are self-governing, it's the way we... We throw out the guys in Washington who have forgotten that they work for us and not the other way around. And that's what this is. This is a revolution. This is President Trump is leading a revolution of the American people to try to get back the government so that it's out of the hands of corrupt people who are doing their own bidding. Okay, now I've got to ask you this question. Having having done a couple of books myself, uh, what did you think yeah. of the process of having to do the having to record your voice reading your own book? Well, I. You know, you and I, unlike most people who do these books, we actually write these books. And right. so I yes. wrote the book myself, word for word for word. Um, and it was a really good experience because I got to I got to sort of live through it again. I was angry at parts of it. But there were parts of it where I thought, wow, you know, I really, I, I come out of this a very inspired person because the American system renews itself and regenerates in some of our finest times have been when we've had these political revolutions, whether it was the American Revolution or Andrew Jackson or the Reagan Revolution, and we come out of them, our country renewed. So I think as miserable as all this is right now, none of us like it, that in a couple of years' time we will be a nation reborn, and that's the strength of America. We, re- we recreate ourselves, not only as individuals, but as a nation. No other country in the world does that, and that's something so precious. We can't lose that. Amen to that. Uh, listeners, if you guys want to order KT McFarland's book, if you text the word data to 33777, I'll send you back a link to Amazon so you can buy it right now, uh, even while we're talking about this. Uh, a couple of minutes left here. What do you see moving forward when it comes to China and Russia and this administration? I mean, it seems like we've got to do something with China. Yeah, I, I think that this, this whole virus has been a wake-up call. You know, for for years, the Republican and Democrats have not stood up to China, and China's been taking advantage of us. We let them, um, but but we shouldn't have let them. And and they they've done what they wanted to do, which was steal intellectual property. Um, they wanted to have uh, their exports come into the American market at at no tax. Our exports into them were very high taxes. 
So President Trump had already started standing up to China, which is why I supported him in the first place. But now with this, I think the world sees, gee, do we really want a world dominated by China? Do we really want the 21st century to be the Chinese century? That's how they've handled this whole virus. They knew they had a problem. They shut down travel within China they, so it wouldn't spread from Wuhan to other parts of China. But they let uh, travelers go in and out of Wuhan from abroad. So they were spreading the virus abroad, uh, while at the same time they were shutting it down in their own country. This is not who we want to set the international rules of order. And I think that going forward, the policy should be, number one, bring the supply chain home. We don't want component parts to the new jet fighter made in some other country, whether China or others. Bring the ph- pharmaceutical supply chain home. Um, and then make sure that we work with our allies, um, you know, Japan, South Korea, Ch- uh, Mexico, Canada, the Brits, the Europeans, to all of us together stand up to China because we've all been exploited by this. And then finally, the most important thing that we really need to do for the future, make sure we maintain our technology edge. We've always taken it for granted, but we haven't invested in it like we should. And so we should start really focusing on the technologies of the future, artificial intelligence, robotics, microprocessing, you name it, and not let other countries, especially China, either steal the stuff from us or buy the stuff, the technology from us, that we should invent it and maintain it right here at home. Is, I, let me pick your brain on something real quick before you get off of here. I, I, a person way smarter than me commented on an email recently that uh, one of the things we ought to consider is given the situation with Italy, Spain, Germany, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, that there's an opportunity for a strong Western front alliance against China that could bring Russia into the fold against China, given some of their historic grievances with each other, and that Donald Mm -hmm. Trump is probably best positioned to do that, and the media and Democrats would lose their mind if the president tried to bring Russia into something like that. The media would much prefer to go with China than have the president do something like that. Well, yeah, that's a very insightful um, comment that you've just made, because I've always said that the worst thing that could happen is if China and Russia get together in this modern world with Russian mm-hmm. weapon systems, Chinese money, that that would be a really formidable foe for us. And I think you're right. We, we bring in the countries which are democratic, um, have free market systems, obey the rule of law, believe in freedom of navigation and free trade, and then we stand up together. And maybe Russia comes into the fold. I mean, if I'm Russia right now, I'm not really sure I'm trusting China on my border. Right. So maybe there is an opportunity to do that. There wasn't in the first term of President Trump because of the whole Russia hoax. It was a fake from the start, but the media and the Democrats perpetuated it. But maybe in a second term, who knows? I, I just think that the, we need to stand up to China because you know what? In, in 2024, it's too late. The Chinese have already won. So it's whoever is the next president is the one that either is going to stand up to them and, and reorganize America or is going to just give in to China. Well, KT McFarlane, you've been generous with your time. Thank you so much. The book is Revolution, Trump, Washington, We the People. You can order it by texting DATA to 33777. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you, Eric. Good to talk to you. You too. KT McFarlane, a former Deputy National Security Advisor to the President. She was a speechwriter for Casper Weinberger during the Reagan administration. And again, her book is uh, Revolution, Trump, Washington, and We the People. You can te- order it by texting DATA to 33777. And you'll get all the Georgia uh, stuff and the IHME model. If you want to look at the revised IHME model, which is great news for Georgia, I've got that set up so you can see that as well. Man, I forget how quick that commercial break can be. <laughs> Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. Speaking of commercials, I should put a plug in for Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce. It's happening today. I will take pictures. Uh, I, I got my Rec Tech grill put together. I'm going to smoke chicken breast for supper tonight. Uh, uh, allegedly, I can put them on at four o'clock and smoke them low and slow for about an hour or and a half. And then crank up the heat to about 400 to crisp the skin at the end of that's That's the theory. And I've got my Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce to to slather on them as well, which I am excited about. So uh, you should get yourself some because we actually do use it in our house. It actually is a great old school southern barbecue sauce. Uh, and you can go to Mrs. Griffin's.com or your local Walmart. You're, you're, I've seen it at Ingalls. I got it at my Publix across the street. 
you should get it. And thank you to them for sponsoring the show. Y'all, um, I want to spend a, just a couple of more minutes here regarding what KT McFarland and I were talking about on China. There's going to be a real issue, and I suspect this is something where the Trump administration actually can uh, differentiate themselves with Joe Biden. Because, you know, uh, Biden's son, Hunter, is on the payroll. Of, well, I, I shouldn't say he's on the payroll, but he's been getting business out of China. He and John Kerry's son have been making money out of China. Do you really think that Joe Biden is going to stand up to China? Uh, I just, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I, I have a hard time thinking so. I have a hard time thinking that uh, Joe Biden will do anything except maintain the Obama administration positions, which were deeply sympathetic to China, and did not stand up. There's going to be a reckoning with China. And I really do think that we should be smart and try to figure out a way to get the Russians on our side. And I really do think that the Trump administration probably is best positioned to do that. And I really do think the more I've thought about it, that the media will never let it happen, or at least try to stop it. The Democrats will as well. It seems very obvious to me that the media would far prefer it uh, if China was more dominant. We weren't. And, and part of this, I don't know. I shouldn't say prefer it. Maybe some of them do, but there has been an expectation for the last decade. Going back to the Bush administration, remember when right after Bush became president, uh, the Chinese forced one of our uh, intelligence surveillance planes on the ground? There has been a presumption ever since that our days are numbered and China is going to be dominant. And there hasn't been a conversation in the American press about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. It was just accepted that this was going to happen. And the media, I think, overwhelmingly seems to be okay with letting that happen. The media overwhelmingly seems to expect that it's going to happen and doesn't want to do anything to disrupt those expectations. I, I, I think the media does tend to think that this is just going to happen. We might as well accept it. There's no reason to stand up to it. Uh, and, and who cares about the implications? Well, the implications are striking globally. You know, for example, let, let me let me diverge here for just a moment onto Facebook. I actually think of the tech players, Facebook is a is a better technology player than most of the other companies. Now, full disclosure, uh, Google and Facebook have both sponsored my conference in the past. Microsoft as well has played a role in sponsoring my conference in the past. Uh, I, I know a number of the tech players, and I think that Facebook, by and large, has been a more honest broker to conservatives than a lot of the others. Facebook has allowed things. For example, remember the Nancy Pelosi video where someone slowed down her speech or some such, and uh, Twitter took it down, Google took it down off YouTube. Facebook left it up and said, it, it, it's it's fair play. It, it's parody, It's or it's sarcasm, or what have you. And the media lost their mind. You know, Facebook used to be a hero to the left and to the press when Barack Obama harnessed the power of Facebook to connect with people and get himself elected and then reelected. He dominated the platform. Well, in 2016, the Trump campaign dominated the platform, and, and suddenly Facebook is enemy number one. And I think that's very telling. I, I think it is is really interesting that the media was perfectly happy to play up Facebook and then uh, suddenly they're the enemy because of Donald Trump getting elected. Well, Facebook, as a result, understands it's got some media damage out there. And, and one of the things Facebook is doing is trying to uh, abdicate responsibility for content on its platform to an outside group. That is basically, think of it as a Supreme Court. Uh, the, things will be, if they take stuff down, you can appeal to this group. And the way this group will work is there will be three people. They're all legal experts from around the world, one from your country guaranteed, and then two others. The problem is that the United States has the greatest free speech laws on planet Earth. And so if Facebook allows you to appeal to a group and there are two people who aren't from your country, from this country, and one who is, the two who are from more regressive countries could overrule the one from this country, 
and your free speech could be pulled in the direction of a more repressive repressive government. In fact, every other government on the planet is uh, worse than the United States on free speech. So essentially, uh, if free speech on Facebook for Americans will be pulled back and it's an American company, shouldn't they want to uphold American standards? Every time I've met with people from Facebook, they're rah, rah, we're America. We don't even do business in China. America, F, yeah. I mean, to, to, to go with a team America, you know that you know the movie, you know the movie, probably shouldn't watch it, but you know the movie. Uh, and it, they, they've been really um, big on that. And it's just, it's striking to me that they want to do that. And this is something you see in the media, where the media seems to be okay with more repressive regimes becoming increasingly dominant on the world, as opposed to wondering what can the United States do to rebound. Now, the problem is that so many of the people in the media are so far left, the answer, oh, socialism, we should have socialism, and, and that will make us stronger. You mean you want us to adopt the economic policies of those countries that seem to be gaining on us, as opposed to being more free market, where when we were more free market, we did a better job. Uh, these sorts of things need to be kept in mind. They, they need to be kept in mind, and I don't think enough people are. When we come back, we got to get into Brian Kemp's good news. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. How are you? The phone number, if you would like to be a part of this year program, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Uh, happy to take your phone calls. Where does Brian Kemp go for an apology? Where, where does where does he go? There is really good news, and I've looked in uh, newspapers around the state, and I don't see the good news. Nope, it's not there. Nope, not there. Ah, uh, no, you you no nope, nope. You would never know it there. Um. No, it's, it's, nope, not in that newspaper. Nope, 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 nope. I, I, I got all the newspapers in the state booked. Nope, not there. Oh, nope, nope. There's, there's, this one looks, look, doom and gloom. Nope, not, not in, it's, it's not in the AJC. Would it, let, let me refresh the AJC. Nope. No, no, they, they've, they've moved on. It, it's, it's top story is, is, uh, Ahmad Arbery, uh, nope, nope, not there, nope, up, up, President Trump predicts 100,000 U.S. coronavirus test vaccine by years in, no, so that's, that's not, nope, that's, that's not it, nope, where, where's the good news, I don't see, I've looked at all the newspapers, I've got all the newspapers, book, I, I don't see, I, I don't see the story, where's the good news, because there's really good news, why isn't the good news out there, I will tell you the good news, Jesus died for you and rose again from the dead. And if you put your faith in him, you have eternal life. That's the actual good news. But no, there's actually real good news here in the state of Georgia. You remember when Brian Kemp reopened the state on April 20th, he said we were going to reopen the state. And boy, was there hell to pay for Brian Kemp daring to say we were going to reopen the state. I mean, people, it was a meltdown. Here is, here's Eugene Robinson on uh, MSNBC. The governors are in a different position because they have to, the, the, all the governors, really, Republicans and Democrats, they have to, to maintain some sort of working relationship with the federal government and with President Trump. Uh, Governor Cuomo is is apparently coming to visit him today at the at the White House, for right. example, um, uh, because they are trying to protect the citizens of their states, and 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 they have to do that. So I understand why they are trying to walk this this, this tightrope. Except the governor of Georgia, who's just lost his mind. Uh, Georgia governor lost his mind. Here's Elise Jordan, a Democratic partisan. Well, I understand the desperation that there is right now and the need to get back sure. to work, the need to get back to normalcy. But the problem is we aren't going back to normal. We aren't going back to normal anytime <laughs> soon. And people understand that. And there's a there's so much fear right now over the unknown. And as these diagnoses 
continue to grow, especially the decision to open Georgia is particularly baffling given what's happening in the southern part of the state. And we have Stacey Abrams later in the show, and she certainly can talk about how well Governor Kemp administered the 2018 midterms and with what efficiency he operated as Secretary of State. And so it's just scary that there's this attitude that you can completely disregard the facts as to what is the actual science right now. Uh huh. Well, uh, what is the actual science? You know, all of the people who complained that Brian Kemp wasn't uh, closing the state. He wasn't listening to the experts. He listened to the experts and closed the state when they told him to. Uh, now he listened to the experts when they said he could reopen. And they got mad at him for that. They, they wanted him to go get different experts. Well, where does he go for his apology? Ron Fournier, uh, who I know and actually like the guy, he, he's a very pleasant person. Um, he was the head of the Associated Press, and you'll recall when he was the head of the Associated Press, he got fired, including from me, for saying his reporters could uh, be a little more forthright with their opinions. Uh, Ron Fournier is definitely on the left, um, undoubtedly on the left, and he has increasingly become, I think, I would say angry during the Trump administration. As so many people have who don't like Trump, they become more angry. Uh, the anger from despair, I, I guess you could say, over the direction of the country. They they really do believe the country is headed in a very bad place. They don't recognize that the, the Trump administration is just built on the precedence of the Obama administration. Maybe in a different way politically, but it's just built on the precedence of the Obama administration that they were perfectly fine with. Uh, and he tweeted on April 20th after Brian Kemp announced he would reopen the state. Mark this day because two and three weeks from now, the Georgia death toll is blood on his hands. And as Georgians move around the country, they'll spread more death and economic destruction. That was April 20th because two and three weeks from now, the Georgia death toll is blood on his hands. In fact, as I mentioned yesterday, the hashtag Brian Kemp blood on his hands it was a trending topic on social media for more than 24 hours. It gave an excuse for Stacey Abrams to go out and start attacking Brian Kemp on MSNBC. She was all over the place attacking Brian Kemp. Well, you know, it turns out, as I said at the time, I, I was hesitant to get out to it. I, I still intend to mostly shelter in place. But the data was, as I said then and still say now, the data was on Brian Kemp's side. There has been a major update to the modeling from the IHME. The IHME is the uh, is the modeler out of the University of Washington that uh, projects the virus. It is relied on by the Trump administration. It is relied on by the 50 states. It is relied on by the military. Uh, it is that good. Now, you can you can say the models get it wrong, but, you know, the point of the model is to tell you the worst-case scenario and hope that you never reach it. Uh, a lot of people have, have misframed the models. Uh, it, it, think of it like a hurricane model, if you will. You know the big projection maps of here are all the places the hurricane could go, and here's the wide range, and, and you see one of them shows you all the different models and, and the lines where they're going to go, and they're compiled into a composite bubble that expands – and uh, as the hurricane moves, the bubble moves and contracts, and ultimately you see where it makes landfall. And the models are very much the same way, except uh, an epidemiological model shows you here is, in the worst case scenario, what we think is going to happen. And your goal is to never reach the model. And thankfully, we haven't reached the model. But the model in Georgia, after Brian Kemp announced that we were going to reopen, it shot up. Uh, the model had gone from about 2,000 people dead by, by uh, August to something like 5,000 people dead. In fact, uh, I looked. I just happened to look. The reason I'm going to use June 12th is only because I looked and I screenshotted it. And the model day before yesterday showed that in Georgia on June 12th, there would be 1,783 new cases reported that day. New daily cases of 1,783. And that we would be doing about 10,631 tests that day. Well, they revised the model because the testing in Georgia has improved dramatically. Not only has the testing in Georgia improved dramatically, contact tracing in Georgia 
has approved, improved dramatically. Contact tracing has improved dramatically. And guess what? Guess what? Believe it or not, the people of the state of Georgia are actually doing what the governor said. Most people are still wearing, although the number's going down, uh, fewer and fewer people are wearing masks. I was at the grocery store last night. I was at Publix last night. And uh, the other day, I was I was in the majority wearing masks. And last night, I was in the minority wearing masks. Most people were not wearing masks. It was 30 minutes before closing time. All the employees had masks on. Most of the people walking around did not have masks on, regardless of age. Some did. Uh, and, but... So the revisions are down to 367 new daily cases on June 12th. Now, the more remarkable thing is that uh, the the daily projections from the IHME two days ago showed that we would still have about 1,000 cases a day reported in Georgia on July 1st. And we would have still over 100 cases a day reported on August 1st. So according to the data, according to the data, on July 1st, the IHME model showed we'd have about 1,000 new cases, and on August 1st, about 100. They Again, they've revised it down. On July 1st now, they project we will have less than 100 new daily new cases, and on August 1st, we will have zero new daily cases. It's a dramatic reduction, a, a, a tenfold reduction. It is a huge reduction. Again, if you want the more precise number, on July, on June 12th, two days ago, they projected we would have 1,783 cases reported that day and a range between 336 and 5,487. The, the, the median there is 1,783. But according to the model, you know, the models have a range. It could be 336 new cases to 5,487 new cases. The probability resides at 1,783 new cases. Here's the, here's the new one. 367 is the median where they expect, well, the probabilities will have 367 cases that day instead of 1,000 whatever, 1,783. And the range is now 25 to 1,502. Y'all, that's remarkable. Well, you know what's more remarkable? I talked to people close to the governor's office yesterday. They didn't get any media calls about the change. You know, the governor announced he was going to reopen on April 20th, and the way it would work is that the end of that week, that was a Monday, and that end of that week, April 25th, uh, barbershop salon, nail salons, uh, massage uh, therapists, bowling alleys, they could all reopen. Now, why? Because those are small businesses that tend to have direct relationships with customers, including the bowling alleys. You go to your local bowling alley, you tend to know them. But in practical reality, the, what the media failed to report is that, for example, the bowling alley technically could reopen, but practically could not because it did not have the the safety parameters that would be allowed uh, to get it to reopen. So, yes, in, in theory, a bowling alley could have reopened on uh, on April 25th. In the reality, none of them could. And the media failed to report that. The media failed to report the governor's requirements for opening. They treated it as a full reopening, and it wasn't. It was a slow-rolling reopen with abundant precautions. And what they failed to report as well is that the governor didn't lift the shelter-in-place order. So even though the bowling alley could reopen and get ready, they really couldn't have customers for another week because the shelter-in-place order was still in effect. And the media completely ignored that, too. Well, now the shelter-in-place order has expired, and the businesses have started reopening slowly. This week, the governor expanded the number of people who could be inside a restaurant to eat. And the IHME model has revised down dramatically down such that they believe by August now we'll be close to zero new daily cases where their old model had zero daily cases not hitting until almost Labor Day. So a month ahead of schedule, we'll be almost wiped out of cases before July 1st now. That's really good news and you're not hearing it in the media. It's not a big story in the press today. The, the national media assailed Brian Kemp as popularity cratered. 
and they highlighted the crater. And in fact, CNN has a big analysis of today. This one governor was most hurt by his COVID-19 response. And it's Brian Kemp. Are they going to report this now? I mean, they're the ones who who did the character assassination on him. They're the ones who said he was a hick and a rube for doing it. Where's his apology? Where does he go for his apology? Where does Brian Kemp go for his apology? Now, let's be honest here. Brian Kemp doesn't care. He doesn't feel the need to have an apology. He's not going to go out and seek an apology. But where is it? Where's the apology? You know what they're doing? You know, like Ron Fournier, who, who, by the way, again, I like, but he said, well, it, it, it may be another week. Let, let's wait another week or two weeks and see if there's a spike there. If there's a spike and, you know, the governor said we may see an increase in cases if people don't do what they need to do. We may see an increase in cases. Will it be outside the, the, the norm for the rest of the states? How will we know it's Georgia causing it as opposed to other states bringing it in here? How will we know? It's not that the media is going to apologize or not. It's that they want to wait for the bodies to pile up and then do a see, I told you so moment. The question is whether or not you guys let them have the see, I told you so moment. And that depends on you being responsible and still maintaining your distance, wearing masks, washing your hands and do what you can do to keep the virus from spreading. But the governor is owed an apology. And you guys should understand there's really good news out there for Georgia. The phone number here is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. If you want to see the IHME modeling, uh, you can see you can't see the old model because when they change it, they don't keep the historic stuff. They they uh, just revise it. Uh, but if you want to see it, if you want to see the daily information from the Georgia Department of Public Health, uh, text the word data to 33777. I'll send you back both links. You're also going to get a link. I interviewed in the last hour, KT McFarland. She's got a new book coming out about the president uh, and, and his campaign. Y'all, uh, but you need to see the data. Don't be scared of the model. And don't distrust the model. Take a model for what it is. Uh, the, the model is to show you what could happen. And you need to take the model. Every epidemiologist I've talked to has said your goal is to never actually make the model right. Your goal is to beat the model. Uh, and that's what we're doing here in Georgia. Now, to the phones, James calling from Griffin. Welcome to the program. Hey, Eric. I'm a big fan of your show. Thank you. Um, but, you know, I'm I'm one of those people, you know, when I listen to the radio, I actually research and look through things because I just don't want to listen blindly. Good for you. Um, I was looking at the daily infections and testing data on the IMHE model, mm-hmm. and it's showing on August 1st that we're still going to have about 20 infections that day. Um, and that um, July 1st, we're still going to have over 100 infections a day. Um, can you explain the difference between that and what you stated earlier? Yeah, I was pulling up a screenshot of it, uh, and I couldn't roll my cursor over because it wasn't loading earlier. Yep, uh, 116 on July 1st, uh, possibly 18 on August, uh, 19 on August 1st. So that's what it was. I, I'm trying to, if you can see the model, the... The line at 19 on August 1st looks like where it is at the beginning where it's zero. And I couldn't roll my cursor over because the site wasn't loading. So I was guesstimating that that's where it was. <laughs> does that answer your question? It does. And and on your comment about the mask, um, I've seen a whole bunch of people not wearing masks. And that concerns me um, because of the study that came out and said that in order to keep the numbers low, 80% of people need to be wearing masks. And so that's yep. very concerning to me. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I'm glad you brought that up, James, because I was uh, going to talk about that in the next segment. In Slovenia, uh, they have reopened the country and they require people to wear masks and no one is testing positive for the virus anymore. Uh, and so the study came out and said that if 80% of people would wear a mask when they go out in public, we would wipe out the virus well ahead of schedule. And there are so many people who don't want to, but we could actually get rid of this thing and go back to our daily lives if we did it, which is what South Korea has done as well. Now, more to your point, um, if you go, if, if, don't like James did, don't rely on my word because I was having to guesstimate since I couldn't load the website. Now it's loading again. So text the word data to 33777. Let me roll across and give you the trend line. July 1st. Estimated infections, 116, with a range from 2 to 630. By, let's do July 4th. July 4th is 97 cases. Uh, Go to August 1st. August 1st is 19 cases. 
August 2nd is 18. August 3rd is is 18. August 4th is uh, 17. It doesn't go further than that, but the range goes to zero. So essentially, we do have zero by August 1st. The old model had us closer to 1,000 in July and several hundred August 1st. So let's just take August 1st. And again, I, I don't have the old screenshot from August 1st from two days ago. But it was well over 100 cases on August 1st, and now they're saying precisely 19 with a range of 0 to 157. That's really good news considering where we were. July 1st was 1,000 cases. July 1st was 1,000 cases two days ago. The Right now, 116. That's really good news. That's really good news. And you don't see it in the media. Now, why? Because here's the most interesting part, and you can see it for yourself again, just like James did. You, you can see it for yourself. You can text data to 33777. The IHME provides this brown dotted line of estimated infections. Here's why they revised it down so much. What did they tell us? As the number of tests go up, the number of confirmed cases will go up. You can see from yourself that for yourself, the number of confirmed cases or the number of tests has gone up dramatically in the state and the number of confirmed cases is remarkably holding the same that's really really good news for the state of georgia and our media needs to be focusing on the good news if it bleeds it leads but you know this is really good news they need to cover it it is eric erickson here now stepping outside the boundaries of the state of georgia yes Welcome. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. I may go into those details later. We'll see. But right now, I want to go to Jay, waiting patiently where I am in Macon, where the sky is blue. Welcome, Jay. Hey, Eric. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, Hey, I haven't had decent political representation since you got out of politics. (laughs) um, Man, that was the worst (laughs) job I ever had. (laughs) Well, we're thankful that you took it. Some of us are down in down in Macon, but hey, I, just a couple of quick comments. You know, you were talking about the, uh, about Governor Kemp, and you know, he does he deserves a lot. And I want to add to that just one thing. You know, the president wasn't really standing in his corner. Uh, you know, he kind of said, you know, I don't know, Brian may be going a little bit too early, and maybe I wouldn't do it. So, you know, the governor was a man on an island. Um, he was a political leader that looked at facts and made a decision. My God, how revolutionary idea is that? Yeah. But, um, you, you know, the other thing that drives the socialist, oppressive liberals crazy about people like us in Georgia, Eric, is you told us what we needed to do to flatten the curve, and we did it, and we can go from here. You know, we can figure it out. Tell us yeah. what we need to do to stay safe, and we'll figure it out. We don't need oppressive you know, liberal governing to shelter us in our homes like we're in communist North Korea. You know, we can figure it out. And, you know, i got a song for him, Hank Williams Jr., you know, Country Boy Can't Survive. So (laughs) just tell us about it. We can figure it out down here. So, Jay, have you seen the – have you seen the tirade from Dave Portnoy of Barstool uh, Barstool Sports? Yes. Okay, I, I can't play it on radio because of the profanity, but yeah, I mean, it, it, like he says, when did flatten the curve turn into, oh my God, we can't leave until we find a cure? Yeah, it's, I mean, we're, we're, we, we, are, we are Americans. I mean, give us knowledge. Tell us what we need to do. We're not stupid, um, and, and we're going to show them down in Georgia. I know they think we're a little hick Trump state. But we're going to show them. We, you know, we can figure this out. We are Americans, and that means something. Amen to that. Listen, thank you very much for the phone call. Appreciate it. The phone number here, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. And to Jay's point, yeah, tell us what we need to do. Now, listen, I realize there is this antagonism among some people on the right out there about wearing masks in public. And I, I it, it frustrates me because all of the research, you know, I, I got to say the CDC and the World Health Organization's advice early on to not do it will go down in history as one of the worst pieces of advice is given in modern times. 
because we now know from Taiwan, South Korea, and Slovenia, the three countries that overcame COVID-19 faster than anyone else, they mandated masks in public, and people started wearing masks in public, and the virus is gone. And they're not really having to rebound. In some isolated pockets in South Korea, they are, and those rebounds are coming from bars and nightclubs. And the bars and nightclubs are now closed down again in South Korea, which is why Brian Kemp has extended their closure in the U.S. Turns out that when you're out having a good time, having a few beers and, and drinks with buddies, you, you're not going to stay away from each other. Uh, I, I gotta, I gotta, um, I gotta say that I think the data is on Brian Kemp's side, but the data is also on the side of wearing your mask. Part of this, you know, let, let me, I wasn't going to, but let me get into this. Um, Jonah Goldberg, uh, you know, Jonah and I, we don't get to hang out a whole lot, but he's, he's, he's a great writer. There are, t- there, you know, I got to know George Will and his wife, and they're wonderful people. And when I was a kid, I loved to read George Will. Yeah, when I was a kid, I loved to read him because, uh, it, he is, he's, he's just, man, he writes incredibly. And I, I just, I think the world of him and let's, oh, come on. Um, where's my password? I can't get into his G file all of a sudden. Um, where is I'm locked out of my account to get into Goldberg's G file. This is a problem. Let me see if I can do it this way. Um, because it's worth it's worth reading. It's worth talking about. He makes some great points. Uh, and part of that is, let's see, G file. Can I find it here? Yes, I can. Here we go. Part of the thing that Jonah Goldberg writes is that in the culture war, you've got to have, um, you, you have to have more warriors in the culture war. And the way to get the culture war revved up is to fire people up and make them angry. And the way to fire them up and make them angry is to give them a grievance. And these days... The way more and more that you give people a grievance is to just infuriate them because fighting the culture war is more important than what the war is about. So you've got to rev people up in the culture war. Okay, now I've got access to the whole thing, so I I don't have to crib from Jonah. I can just read some of this brilliance to you. It all started... Uh, nope, that's that's not the one I want. Uh, never mind, forget it. I can't get into it. That frustrates me. Um, I genuinely think, here we go, culture war generals need troops, and culture war troops constantly need new things to be angry about, including wearing face masks during a pandemic. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get into this thing. I should have access to it, and I don't. I should have gotten it earlier. But that's that's the point, though. Culture war generals need troops, and culture war troops constantly need new things to be angry about, including wearing face masks during a pandemic. I I need to insult some of you, and I don't mean to insult some of you. I don't want to drive away listeners. I'm trying to grow this show. We're, We're now crossing state lines with this show. Slowly but surely, we're building an empire here. I don't want to burn bridges with my listeners, but this is going to insult a whole lot of you. How many of you are whipped up into an angry frenzy about wearing masks in public? I have a sneaking suspicion you're angry because you heard people on TV and radio yelling about it. The idea did not pop into your head. The idea that probably popped into your head first was, hmm, maybe I should do this not because I don't want to get it, but because I don't want to have it and not know it and spread it to other people. Hmm, maybe I should do this because I'm a responsible member of my society. Hmm, maybe I should do this because, you know, those idiots at the local grocery store who cluster around the the packages of ho-hos when I'm trying to get past them to get to the bread, and I got to walk right past those mouth breathers, and they may have the virus and get me sick. I might as well be precautious. 
Hmm. I don't want to give it to anyone. Hmm. I don't want to get it from anybody. I, I bet that was your first thought. And then you heard someone somewhere railing on it and you respect that person. And you respect that person enough and they go on and on and tell you it's, it's, it's an affront to your liberty. And you sure hmm. I, this is a give me liberty or give me death. Hmm. I, I, I think I can't wear a mask because it's tyranny to make me. Do, how dare the government tell me government can't tell me what to do. Oh, I got to buckle my seatbelt and get in the car before I drive. <laughs> Y'all. It's like wearing your seatbelt. The, the government makes you do it. I don't see you out protesting in the streets over having to wear your seatbelt. Now, some of you don't wear your seatbelt, and you should. But most of you do what you're supposed to do to keep yourself and everyone else safe. There are community obligations. I, I Listen, I, I'm, I'm a small government conservative and, and believe in rugged individualism. But I also rec- recognize that a rugged individualist still has responsibilities to his community. You got to pay your taxes. You got to stop at the stop sign that the government tells you to stop at. You can't run the red light. You got to wear your seatbelt to help bring down uh, insurance for yourself and others, car insurance. And you got to wear a mask in public if you're in a crowd. Now, in Georgia, they're not mandating it. But I think Joan is right here that uh, there are the culture war generals. that They're so busy fighting. They want to own the left. They don't care what they're fighting about anymore. I mean, what is it um, from... from um, and, oh, gosh, why does this live? 1984? I mean, we're always at war with the left. Nobody even knows what we're fighting about anymore. We should know what we're fighting about. Uh, we should not be fighting over the idea of wearing a mask in public. There are things to fight about. And I got to tell you, I think it makes our side less serious over time. When you're screaming about not wearing a mask in public, just just put a mask on. If you're, and you know you don't have to. Uh, frankly, last night, I didn't wear a mask. I went into a grocery store and I did not wear a mask last night. Call me a hypocrite if you must, but why did I not wear a mask last night when I went to a grocery store? I didn't because I knew it was right at closing time and there were only like three cars in the parking lot that weren't employees' cars. So I knew the odds are that I could run in, grab what I needed, and come out. And sure enough, I was the only – there were customers in there, I'm sure, but I was the only customer I saw. I went in, grabbed what I needed. Now, about 30 minutes before, I went into Publix, and the parking lot was full, and I put a mask on when I went in. Use your best judgment. Use your best judgment, y'all. But the idea that it's a civil rights violation to make you put on a mask, uh, no, stop being an idiot. And again, I go back to this. How many of you are really followers and you don't even know it? Every, every conservative I know says we like to think for ourselves. And it's amazing how when you get some loud mouth out there screaming at you that this is an affront to your civil liberties, uh, you change your position because the loud mouth uh, says all the time, oh, it's an affront to my civil liberties. I read it on Twitter, on social media. They're talking about this. I, I guess it's an affront to my civil I thought you thought for yourself. You know an easy way to understand the mask thing is the Second Amendment. You and I both know that if we're not responsible gun owners, that the tables will turn on us and public support for the Second Amendment will crater. The media keeps trying to make support for the Second Amendment crater. They amplify everything to try to make it happen. And you and I know and everyone else knows that by and large, gun owners are responsible people. And one of the responsibilities you learn in gun safety classes, the responsibility that I teach my kids, the responsibility you teach your kids, is you never, ever, ever put your finger on the trigger unless you intend to pull it and fire the gun. It doesn't matter if you know the gun is unloaded. You never put your finger on the trigger. And it is a matter of safety and responsibility. It's not because you're scared. It's not a matter of fear. It's a matter of responsibility. It's a matter of safety. It's the same with wearing a mask in public. You're doing it not because you're scared of getting the virus, and you do it not because you're scared of of giving it to someone. The odds are you could walk around with your gun, with your finger on the trigger of a gun, and you never, never go off because you're responsible and you're careful. But as a matter of safety and responsibility, you don't do it because the accident could happen, and you've got to be mindful of that. The situation could change, and you got to be mindful of that. The same with wearing a mask in public. If you go into a crowd, wear a mask. Here's the thing. 
the data in Georgia is really freaking good. It is really good. We are on the rebound as a state. Our economy is starting to open back up. People are starting to go back to work. The IHME modeling is continuing to go down. The daily cases statewide continue to go down. Per capita, our testing is now in the top 10 of states. And we keep it that way by being responsible. We keep it that way by being responsible people, by continuing to keep our distance, by wearing masks when we go into crowded grocery stores and, and places like that. And we help the governor. I mean, ultimately, here's the bottom line here. The governor of the state of Georgia took a huge political risk. He was a man on an island, as Jay called it and said. He was a politician on an island. Everyone was shooting in his direction. No one wanted to stand with the governor. And the governor said, ultimately, I trust Georgia. And I trust Georgians to do the right thing. When you go in public, you need to wear a mask. You need to keep your social distance. Keep washing your hands. Keep avoiding your face. Stay out of large crowds. And just do the right thing. And we'll be fine. I'm going to trust Georgia. That's what he said. And everyone else said, you can't trust Georgia. You can't trust the people. you got to mandate it. you got to mandate masks. you got to order them to stay home. You're not even arresting enough people. And you know what? He trusted Georgians. And Georgians are being responsible. Vent all you want about wearing the mask. But as long as most of us do it, it's okay. I know people who are not going to wear a mask. Uh, they are so contrarian. I, I mean, they need to repent. Frankly, they've become so contrarian. Uh, they're not even conservative anymore. If everyone says, do, if everyone says, don't jump on the off the bridge, they're going to jump off the bridge because everyone said not to. In the same way, if everyone says wear a mask, they're not going to. I mean, really, I, I know some people out there who, if all of us said unanimously, do not point a gun at your head and pull the trigger, they will point the gun at their head and pull the trigger just to prove everybody wrong before they're dead. There's a level of arrogance in contrarianism and a level of pride in it. Just be responsible out there, though. Be responsible. You'll be fine. We'll keep the virus at bay, and we'll go on about our lives. And, you know, if Georgians are responsible and we do what we need to do, our economy will rebound faster than other states, and it'll give us an economic advantage against these other states. So we might as well keep on chopping wood. It is me. You can call in if you want. Man, where did the time go? 877-97-ERIC. 877-973-7425 is the, the number if you want to call in. I, man, I've been so distracted with all this other stuff, and there's other stuff I wanted to talk about. But wait, where are the daily sound bites? Because I had stuff there I wanted to talk about, and I got so distracted I forgot to load them. Yes, here we go. I want to talk about the bailouts because the bailouts seem to be coming. Have you heard? So the, the Democrats unveiled their new bailout plan. The bailout plan from the Democrats references cannabis more than jobs, which makes you wonder what they're smoking when they do this. But and I, I, I wish I was kidding, but the Democrats have unveiled their latest $3 trillion plan, $3 trillion plan. Uh, to get the economy up and going, and part of their plan is about studying uh, women cannabis sellers and minor how to make more women and minorities legally sell marijuana. Now, I wish I was making that up, but I'm not. Uh, there are more references to selling marijuana in their stimulus plan. Well, Stimulus plan, I guess. <laughs> maybe, maybe they were baked and they they completely forgot what the stimulus bill was about. I, I, it's a stimulus, dude. It's a stimulus bill. I guess we, it's about marijuana. No, it's about getting the economy on track. There are more references to to studying marijuana and and helping women and minorities sell drugs uh, than there is to actually creating jobs in this country. Just absolutely bizarre. Uh, and, and here's Dan Crenshaw on this. For, there's a couple of reasons why that is. For one thing, Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats, they operate in a different reality. They operate in a reality where you can keep everybody locked down forever at the government's orders and then just keep sending them checks in the hopes that there will actually be a con an economy there when we come back. Well, that won't happen. It will wither on a vine. And I think we, we all intuitively know that. Businesses continue to fail, even with PPP funding that can't last forever. And it's like they want to create this sort of socialist utopia where everybody is on some new UBI payment. 
All right, that's not living in reality. That's living in, in, a, in a false utopia. Mm. But second of all, like, as Lindsey Graham said, it's dead on arrival. We haven't been able to see the text of this thing. They didn't draft this at all with Republicans. There was no input whatsoever. You know, I remember all of these freshman Democrats coming to Congress. They flipped a bunch of red seats, and they said over and over and over again that they were here to work with the other side. They just wanted to solve problems. That has never been the case. That has never been the case, not once during this session. And when America needs them the most, when needs them the most to actually work and solve problems, they refuse to do it. Listen. We have to be looking at the problems now with the scalpel. We have to be looking at individual issues and then solving them. You know how we can do that? We could actually be at work. We could actually be at work debating yeah. and, and working in committees and, and moving forward. And I have a bill to do something just like that. A little more from Grinshaw. So, so this is an example of actually solving the problem because the way this was originally drafted and why a lot of Republicans were against it was because – it ended up that we might be paying more p people more money to remain unemployed instead of going back to work. Okay, that's a huge problem, especially when we're trying to get our economy back on track. So what this bill does is it allows, the, allows states to allow people to keep that $600 extra a week for six weeks, even if they go back to work. Okay, because there's no way politically that we're going to be able to remove that benefit at this point. Democrats want to extend that benefit through the end of the year, by the way. If you want to make sure that Americans don't work and remain dependent on the government, well, that's a great way to do it. With my bill, it's a great way to actually keep stimulating the economy but encourage people to get back to work and actually get our, and get our country back on track. Yeah, that's part of the problem that we're dealing with here. There are a lot of people in the country making way more on unemployment than they would make going back to work. And we're going to need to reconsider that situation because we're incentivizing people not to work in this country. And that's a real problem. When we come back, we need to get into politics here in Georgia. Howdy. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. The phone number. You want to be a part of the program? It's my program. Yeah, the Eric Erickson Show. The phone number is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. It is six after the hour. Uh, Richard Burr. Richard Burr, the senator from North Carolina, has had the FBI uh, subpoena him or serve him a warrant and grab his cell phone. They, they want their cell phone. You know who has it? Kelly Leffler. I, I think it's notable uh, that a number of Democrats and uh, Leffler's political opponents tried to wrap her up in the Richard Burr scandal and say she had done something nefarious as well. We actually know that Leffler and her husband uh, did not uh, do as Richard Burr did. Yes, there were sales made. That data did not come from Leffler. It was made with her knowledge. It was information in the public at the time. And her, uh, it, it was what, what, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, I think, uh, were some of the companies that they traded. And, and now Leffler and her husband have actually divested from all individual stocks and are only doing mutual funds and index funds. Uh, just to, you know, David Perdue as well, just to, to move past the Democratic talking points, they're, they're harming themselves economically. They're no longer going to allow their investment advisors to buy individual stocks at American companies. They're going to uh, make them do index funds and mutual funds just so no one has a there there. But I got to tell you um, that, that it, it it's it's amazing that uh, we're in this situation and the, the Leffler ties continue to come. But I mean, it, it's I guess it's amazing, but it's also obvious that she's in the middle of a political fight. But it's Richard Burr who had the FBI come after him, not Leffler. And that's notable in that they don't actually think she did anything wrong. They would be coming after her if they did, too. Now, interestingly enough, there's no love loss between Burr and the Trump administration. Uh, the, Richard Burr is often seen as someone who has covered for the FBI and has protected intelligence sources uh, who were uh, detrimental to the president. So you're not going to see... A lot. In fact, I'm already seeing Trump supporters cheerleading the FBI on this. That is notable. It is something to, to pay attention to. You're not going to see any uh, cheerleading uh, for Richard Burr from Trump supporters. They're, they're out to get him. They're out to get him, which may, does make you wonder if Burr might raise the defense that this is a political witch hunt against him uh, by opponents within the Republican Party. I, I don't know. But it's notable that Leffler is, is not in the mix there. It, it's actually very notable that she's not. 
uh, and is more indication that everyone knows she did nothing wrong and it's political opportunism to go after her. I will tell you, though, who is getting a lot of traction out there, and deservedly so, one of the people who has been most vocal about the Flynn situation and about the uh, screw-ups within the Intelligence Committee is Doug Collins, who's running against Leffler, and he's getting a lot of media buzz, deservedly so. It is it is amazing for those of us who have been talking about this for over a year. I mean, I've released transcripts. We've had Debbie Nunez. We've been talking about this for so many years. And, and really, nobody wanted to believe that at the highest level of the Obama administration, Obama, Biden, you know, Joe Biden can hide in the basement. He can't hide from his facts here that he uh, was in these meetings. And now moving it forward, we're now starting to see that it's all unraveling with the General Flynn case, with the Mueller investigation. It was all just an attack on President Trump and at the time, candidate Trump. So I'm glad to see this is coming out. And it's time people start being held accountable because the way it was going about is you had Comey, McCabe, Strzok, uh, Page, and all these acting as a roving band of, of uh, you know, deputized street thugs going after uh, a candidate for president. Collins has really staked his turf on this, and he's getting a lot of media attention, deservedly so. He's played his cards very smart here. The the thing that I find notable is the amount of – I'm seeing a lot of Doug Collins campaign signs – uh, in my area in middle Georgia, and they're not on the side of the road. I've seen Leffler signs on the side of the road. I've seen Colin signs in people's yards. And Leffler is not building the ties she needs politically, I think. There's only so much loyalty for the governor out there. And, and people like, I like Doug Collins. I, I said I'll vote for Leffler. I think the governor deserves uh, to make the pick, and she deserves to prove herself, and she's got to, should have two years to do it. Uh, but Collins isn't waiting, and he's he's a, an aggressive, good, charismatic politician. He's got a great team around him, and uh, Leffler's going to get a run for her money. And she's got a lot of money to spend, but can she spend it to overcome? Uh, Collins continues to pick up a lot of endorsements. He's got Drew Ferguson, Karen Handel running the sixth is backing him. A number of sheriffs are backing him. Now, uh, Leffler is getting some support in the metro Atlanta area. I think I saw the Gwinnett County Sheriff is supporting her, and a number of others have come out to support her. She's got to do more, though. I can. Can I just? Can, can I be real honest? I don't know Leffler well. Uh, every interaction I've had with her has been nice. I, I feel kind of bad for her uh, in that uh, we're th- she's thrown into this, thrust into the situation willingly. She she wanted to go, and she's got a team around her that is good. But I just I get the sense they're protecting her too much. And l- let me explain this to you um, the way I see this. I, and first of all, uh, let me say again, I like Doug Collins. If Collins is the senator, he'll be a great senator. The reason I'm backing Leffler instead of Collins has nothing to do with Doug Collins, uh, who I would gladly support otherwise. It has to do with, I think, the Constitution of the state of Georgia gives the governor the right to make that pick. I think the governor was entitled to make that pick, and I think Leffler is entitled, therefore, to prove herself. And there will be an election in two years. And if she hadn't done good – Do it then. And I think uh, dividing the field among Republicans in a jungle primary on the general election ballot is a bad idea. So I'm going to back Leffler, but I'm totally fine with Collins. And and I have refused to run hit pieces on Collins at my website, The Resurgent, uh, because I like him. I'm not going to attack Doug Collins. But I want everybody to know where I am. But I got to be real honest with you. Every time I've had a conversation with Kelly Leffler, She's, we've had a good conversation. And when I throw curveballs at Kelly Leffler, like for example, Kelly Leffler's team reaches out. And when they reach out, they want to know what, what do you want to talk to the Senator about? And listen, if anybody does this, just full disclosure, I will always tell people when I'm going to interview them, what are the sorts of things? I won't give them the questions I'm going to ask, but I'll give them the areas. I'm going to ask you about this. I'm going to ask you about this. I'm going to ask you about this. I always also, if you you want to be interviewed on the program, you need to know this. I will almost always, I won't say always, but almost always also ask about something else. Because I understand why they're doing it. They want their person to be prepared, and I get that. When I was on TV back in the day, uh, regularly, when I was at CNN in particular, but then at Fox, um, whenever I had a TV hit, they would send a packet of stuff. Here's all the stuff we're going to talk about. What are your thoughts? Because they want to be prepared. And I feel like uh, I want to give you guys a good show and also to give you a good sense of who this person is. So I don't want to ambush people. I don't like ambush journalism. 
except I always ambush. I always just ask, I always want to throw in one thing just to see how they respond. And it's nothing hard. It's no curveball, but it's just something that they're not expecting. And it's not a, it's not for gotcha moment. It's, I know whoever I interview, they're going to be well prepped by their staff. So let me throw in just one thing that they weren't prepared for and see how they do. And here's the thing with Kelly Leffler. I've done this in every interview I've done with her. And in every one of those interviews, Leffler has responded better and sharper with the things she wasn't expecting than with the stuff that she was expecting. She's almost overprepared. And if you're if you're a lawyer, I learned this in law school, learned it the hard way, actually, in a, in a moot court uh, situation. Uh, you can overprepare sometimes and screw yourself up. And I get the sense that her staff is treating her with kid gloves because she's new to politics. And they're not letting her go out there. And I don't know if they're afraid or she's afraid she might screw something up. But she's really good on her feet when she's talking off the top of her head. For for example, let me give you the example. The last conversation we had, um, we were talking about the COVID-19. We were talking about the briefing. We were talking about uh, everything happening in the state. And I asked her about moral hazard. Having been in finance, it was the perfect topic to raise with her. That we are inevitably going to bail out some companies that should deservedly so collapse. There will be, we will see a recessionary event in the future of the pileup of companies that should have collapsed during this, that won't collapse, and they'll use government money to prop themselves up and continue on for a while, and then ultimately they'll collapse, and they will probably expect another another government bailout. And they will probably say, hey, you know government, um, you bailed us out the last time, you got to bail us out this time. We, we made the decisions we made because we presumed that you would bail us out. And there will be a lot of people in the government who will come along to those financial institutions. It will be banks and lending institutions and, and investment companies. And the government will say, ah, I guess we got to bail you out. We did it in 2009. We did it in 2020. We're going to have to do it now in 2026. And so I raised that with Leffler, and she said, Eric, what you're talking about is moral hazard, and it's a real concern. And we're going to have to deal with that issue, but now is not the time to deal with that issue because we don't have the capacity right now to separate out the people who should be going under and the people who shouldn't be going under. Right now, everybody's going under, and we are going to have to put that off, and we're going to have to deal with it at some point, and we probably will have to revisit the situation. We just can't do it right now. And that was it. I mean, it was less than 150 words, and it was to the point, and it was so refreshing. She didn't want the opportunity to filibuster. She didn't want the opportunity to drag her words out. She just wanted to get to the point and tell me what she thought. And it was great. And that that was the second time she's done that. Now, let's see, that was the second interview I did with her. The first interview, what was the other thing I asked her in the first interview? Um, oh, gosh, I can't remember now what it was. Uh, it was before the year. I, I, anyway, I, I asked I did that before. And it was the same thing. Um, she's just to the point. She was blunt and to the point. And I appreciated that. As a radio show host who oftentimes, you guys here, I don't like to do, I like to have you guys call in. Uh, in fact, there are some days I think, man, are, are people even listening because nobody's calling in? And, and occasionally, like the other day, I was at the store and, and somebody came up to me and said they heard me, me talking about that on the radio. And they said, I just enjoy listening to you. I don't want to call in. And, and that made me feel good. It, it was a good, good reinforcement. But, you know, it, it, I would much rather have people call in who are listeners of the program than do interviews. Because I'd rather interact with you. I, I feel like you're eavesdropping on my conversation when I do interviews. But occasionally, like KT McFarland this morning, she was worth having on. Uh, it's been worth having some people on. Um, but I don't like it when people filibuster. And inevitably, you get a politician on and they just want to filibuster. I, I was interviewing who was who was it was a, a, a no longer in politics here in Georgia. It was a, a, a elected official here in Georgia who I interviewed a while back. And my rule of thumb is to never interrupt someone. When they're answering a question, let them finish, and inevitably you'll get the basis for your next question. Don't interrupt them. Just let them talk. And I had to keep interrupting this person because in a 20-minute interview, I think they could have stopped without a, without a breath, 
they could have run on for that 20 minutes and learned I would have learned nothing because their their answers were so guarded and so um techno speak and technocratic you actually learn nothing corporate ease was was i guess a better phrase you never learn anything and so i was having to interrupt and having to push because they didn't want to answer the question those are the times when i like to interrupt but i would much rather let people talk and learn something from them and get the basis for the next question and have what's called a conversation i i, I used to do a radio show where i would go on and uh the host it was in in california and this host, in, it was a San Francisco conservative radio station, and there was a host who would have me on while I was at Red State and would ask a question. And I swear to you people, I could have said, uh, there's a UFO landing in my front yard. Oh, my gosh, they're splitting open my dog and eating its guts. And the host would have moved on to the next question as if they never even listened to my answer. And it was it was the most bizarre thing, and I hate interviews like that, and I don't want to subject you to them anyway. Um, but uh, this is all a, a rambling discussion on, on the Leffler Collins thing, I realize. But um, Leffler needs to be less guarded and needs to be out there more. And Collins knows this and has taken advantage of it. And he's got the Flynn situation as well. And it's no wonder that he's doing better than her in the polling right now. Her team, I realize they think they've got a long time. They've got until November and people aren't paying attention and the virus is keeping people cooped up. But I'm afraid they get to the point where they're waiting too long and they can't just make it an anti-Doug Collins campaign. They need to make it a pro Leffler campaign. I don't want to see them go nasty against Collins. He's a good guy. Uh, Leffler should be able to, to speak to her own record without attacking Collins. The phone number here is 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Let me remind you that if you need your PPP loan for your small business, go to FirstLibertyGA.com, First Liberty of Georgia, First Liberty Building and Loan. They're in Noonan. Now, if you're listening out of the state, because our show is now broadcast outside of Georgia as well, even though we spend a lot of time on Georgia because that's where all of our stations save one are, um, it, we can, First Liberty Building and Loan can help you anywhere. Doesn't matter what state you're in, First Liberty Building Loan can help you get your payroll protection program loan from the government that converts into a grant if you maintain your payroll so you don't have to pay it back. You got to go to FirstLibertyGA.com. They cannot guarantee it. They're not going to guarantee it, but they can, in fact, try to get you into the program. You need to get your payroll in order, uh, get your documentation of your quarterly payments for payroll, all that stuff. They're going to do their best to help you folks, uh, but it is firstlibertyga.com. There's an apply now button on their website. You don't even have to call them. You can fill it out online. Now, to the phones, we go to Jake calling from Macon, Georgia. Welcome, Jake. How are you? Hi, Eric. Good morning. Um, great show. Eric, I have a little concern, and I just want to get your thoughts. I you know, the first stimulus plan, which was over $2.3 trillion, approximately, I want to say 12% was intended to go to the people in the greatest need. And they have yet, I think as a whole, received that so-called stimulus. And we're talking now about another stimulus of over $3 million and or $3 trillion. And if, if the, the math can be worked out, it's going to be like 10% of that money supposedly will go to the people in the greatest need. And yet the ones in the greatest need are getting pittance compared to, um, you know, all the other stuff that's being thrown into it. I'm, I'm just concerned about but, that. I mean, because- Jake, they'll they'll learn how to become marijuana farmers under the Democrats plan. What more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm not making that up. And I wish I were. But there's actually money in there to teach people marijuana farming skills. <laughs> well, it's amazing. It's 12 percent. It's 12 percent. And I'm like, I'm thinking, well, twelve hundred dollars. A lot of my friends. And said, Jake, have you heard anybody getting the money? I said, no, I haven't. And they said, I- when am I going to get it? And they're talking about another one, right. another $1,200, which is only going to be a small percentage of that three point some trillion dollars. I don't know. I don't know what's happening in government. You know, government's 50 million people, 50 million workers. And not one non-essential department. I don't understand that. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you know, Jake, there's the other thing is is remember remember when the president and the Republicans passed the tax cuts and the typical person, the average American, would get $1,000 back. And the Democrats at this time said, oh, $1,000 is nothing. You can't live on $1,000. And now they want to give you 1200 bucks as if, if $200 more is, is more meaningful. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. So uh, thanks for listening. But I, I'm, I'm against that next – so-called stimulus because it'll, it'll be a giant, giant pork barrel. And I, I, it's just a horrible, it it's a horrible shame for our society. So 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for the phone call. And, and you're right. Um, it, it is, it's not thoughtful. And like Dan Crenshaw, I played that audio earlier. What, what Crenshaw is saying is that the Democrats want to extend the $600 supplemental unemployment benefit through the end of the year. They are incentivizing not working. Y'all, at some point, okay, the, the, hang on a second. I got a screenshot of this headline. I want to read you this headline from the New York Times. I, I screenshotted it in case they changed it. This is the, the headline a little while ago on the New York Times. Virus could be here to stay and economic pain long-lasting. If the virus is going to be here to stay, don't we have to figure out a way to reopen society and get people back out? If the virus is going to be here to stay, don't we have to find a way to navigate through society with it? That's what Brian Kemp has been trying to do, and the media sailed him for it. By the way, Jake Tapper on CNN, I, I got to correct myself. He, he reached out to me when I was lamenting this, uh, the lack of accountability for Jared Paulus in Colorado. And, and Jake said, to, to his knowledge, he's the only one who did. But he did actually engage uh, Jared Paulus on his reopening, particularly when Colorado was doing less testing per capita than Georgia. But Brian Kemp was lit on fire by the national press and the president of the United States for trying to reopen Georgia in a thoughtful way based on the data. It turns out thus far he has been successful so long as you guys don't let your guard down. And he got assailed for it. He took a hit in polling. Republicans are mad at him because he closed down it all. Democrats are mad at him because he opened it all. And now the New York Times reports the virus could be here to stay. Economic pain, long-lasting. I think we're going to have to find a way through. I think we're going to have to find a way to navigate. I think we should be applauding the governors who are trying instead of trying to score political points. But that's not the way things work these days, is it? We need to find a path forward, y'all. We do. And I'm glad our governor here in Georgia has tried, and Bill Lee in Tennessee and several of these other governors who are trying to find a way out of this economic mess that we're in. Hello there. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Rick Bright is testifying before the House of Representatives today. I'm not dwelling on it for a couple of reasons, one of which is his attorney was also Christine Blasey Ford's attorney, a Democratic partisan. Uh, two is because I have read through his complaint and it seems uh, maximized in language and word choice to get all sorts of salacious, blathering attention from the media. And three is because nonpartisan sources who worked with him uh, said that the problem was him and he needed to be transferred and it had nothing to do with politics. And these are not people who care for uh, care for Donald Trump. Uh, they worked in the Obama administration as well. And uh, so it se seems to me that he is uh, nursing a grievance for being fired and is trying to distract from the fact that he deserved to be fired. So I, I see no reason to get worked up about Rick Bright. There's plenty of other stuff to talk about uh, other than him. Uh, I do want to go to the president's comments uh, where he was talking with Maria Bartiromo from early this morning. Here are a couple of these. People are too tough on it. They're not allowed to go out. They can't. They're losing their jobs. We're not going to let it happen. Do you think your critics want you to keep it closed going into the election? Yeah, I do. I do. I think it's a it's a political thing in addition. Uh, I think because some they're states, saying you're putting money, uh, business ahead of lives. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I think the, the people that want to see the right thing happen, they agree with me. We have to get our country open. You know, it was up to some people. Let's keep it closed for a long time, okay? A long time, and watch the United States go down the tube. It's not going to happen. Never going to happen well, on my what watch. I want to ask you. I mean, do you see long-term damage? One more clip from him. The things we've done, I think we're going to have one of the best economic years we've ever had. Dr. Fauci is saying a different thing. He says he's worried about spikes turning into outbreaks. He said it seems like uh, it could be too soon and that the major message he wants to convey uh, is that the danger is uh, if we skip over the checkpoints and the guidelines to open America again, then we risk the danger of multiple outbreaks. So Anthony is a good person, very good person. I've disagreed with him. Uh, when I closed the border to China, he disagreed with that, and then ultimately he agreed, and he said I saved hundreds of thousands of lives, which is what happened. Everybody disagreed when I did that. I think that we have to open our schools. 
young people are very little affected by this. Uh, we have to get the schools open. We have to get our country open. We have to open our country. Now, we want to do it safely, but we also want to do it as quickly as possible. We can't keep going on like this. I mean, you're going to have, uh, you're having bedlam already in the streets. You can't, you can't do this. We have to get it open. Uh, I totally disagree with him on schools. And we will have, uh, I call them embers, I call them spikes. And he called, I notice he used the word spike. Well, you might have that and we'll put it out. You know, we've learned a lot. We didn't know anything about this. This is a horrible disease. This is a horrible plague. I call it a plague. It's a terrible thing. We've learned a lot, and we also know how to put it out. But we have to open our country. We have no choice. You know, people are dying this way, too, when you report this better than I could ever report it. But people are report they're, they're dying with this closure, with this shutdown of a country where they're in the house or in their apartment. They're not allowed. Some people are too tough on it. They're not allowed to go out. They can't. They're losing their jobs. We're not going to let it happen. I want to play one more clip from the president on Fauci before I get to where I want to go with this. Listen to this. This was played up as an attack on Dr. Fauci from the president. I don't think it is, uh, but listen to it. Yesterday, I was a little cautious on reopening the economy too soon. Uh, Do you share his concern? About reopening what? Reopening the economy too soon, some states. Look, he wants to play all sides of the equation. Uh, I think we're going to have a tremendous fourth quarter. I think we're going to have a transitional third quarter. And I think we're going to have a phenomenal next year. I feel that we are going to have a country that's ready to absolutely have one of its best years. Next year, with all of the stimulus and all of the fact that it's a a pent-up demand like I haven't seen. And you see it right now. Uh, These two really professional, good governors that do such a, you know, work so hard. I know both of them very well. One happens to be a Democrat, okay? But we've worked together, and I think we've worked together very well. Uh, And one, you would expect me to say that, but it happens to be true, okay? Um, I, I, I gotta, I gotta tell you, I, I, I really think that the media and some of the president supporters are both trying to get Dr. Fauci fired. And I'm disturbed by it on both sides. Uh, Let me deal with the president supporters first, uh, because I suspect I got some of you listening who are in that camp. You want Dr. Fauci fired because he won't reopen the economy and he's he's saying we need to keep it all closed and people are listening to him. You know, Dr. Fauci is uh, the head of the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Diseases or whatever it's called. He's a career government bureaucrat who's been there since the Reagan administration. He's now one of the highest paid Uh, civil employees. He has advised Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. George W. Bush gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom for leading the AIDS task force that dramatically reduced the uh, rates of HIV infection around the world. Dr. Fauci cannot keep the economy closed. Dr. Fauci... Uh, cannot shut everything down. Dr. Fauci has no power to do anything. The power resides with the chief executive officer of the United States of America under Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution is named the President of the United States who happens to right now be Donald J. Trump. And the people on the right who are the president's supporters who are blasting Dr. Fauci are doing so because they're too chicken to take on the President of the United States. The President of the United States is listening to Dr. Fauci. If you don't want him listening to Dr. Fauci, blame the president. But you people won't blame the president, will you? So you're making Dr. Fauci the bad guy. You're making him the fall guy because you don't want to stand up to the president who you adore and worship. And that's fine. You're in a cult of personality. You're not thinking about this reasonably. And I don't mean to be insulting, but that's what it is. I mean, the president of the United States is the one who's listening to Dr. Fauci. If the country's not reopening, it's because of Dr. Fauci. And the president of the United States, to his great credit, to his overwhelming credit, is willing to have someone on his staff like Dr. Fauci who is warning about things that could happen, and he's allowing him to speak publicly and freely. And it's the media on the other side of this. So when's the president going to fire him? They're clearly at odds. 
The media wants Dr. Fauci fired because they don't like that there's a competent guy whispering in the president's ear. The Trump president's supporters don't like the fact that the president is listening to the competent man whispering in his ear. Everybody's out to get Dr. Fauci. All the man is doing is giving, he is a freaking doctor. His expertise is medicine and infectious disease. That's what they're asking him about. I would be critical of Dr. Fauci if Dr. Fauci, in his advice to the president or to Congress, started talking about the gross domestic product and inflation and monetary concerns, because that's not in his wheelhouse. The president has Larry Kudlow for that. The president has Steve Mnuchin for that. The president has Jerome Powell for that. The president has uh, Wilbur Ross for that. And the president is not listening to them. The president's listening to Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks. Why are they the bad guys? I mean, if you're on the right and you're mad at them, you're really mad at the president for listening to them. The president doesn't have to listen to them, but he is listening to them. And he's gotten great advice from them, by the way. You don't like it, but objectively it is so that the advice has been on point. And it, it, the the people on the other side, the, the people on the other side, the, the people in the media who want him gone, you know why they want him gone? Do you know why the members of the media – and by the way, this is actually – you should be more horrified by the members of the media who want him gone than the, the conservatives out there who want him gone because they don't like that the president's listening to him and they don't want to criticize the president, so they're criticizing Fauci. See, if they were to criticize the president, the, I mean, you've got a you've got a strain of people on the right right now, and it infuriates me because we're all we're all sinners. We all go astray. We all make mistakes, and there are a group of people who are incapable of ever acknowledging the president makes a mistake. Now, I know why they're doing it. They're doing it in a large part because the media always amplifies the mistakes, and so they don't want to ever acknowledge them. And I get that. George W. Bush did the same thing, and it drove me crazy then too when George W. Bush supporters wouldn't admit that he could make a mistake. Yes, George W. Bush made lots of mistakes. And now that he's not president, all the people, you know, I've got friends of mine who used to get mad at me for pointing out the mistakes Bush would make, and now they're pointing them out. And some of them I saw a couple of weeks ago. One of them, a very prominent Republican, was circulating something I had written back in the day about George W. Bush, and that SOB was one of the people who blasted me for writing it then. (laughs) People are stupid and people are funny. You should be more appalled at members of the media who want Dr. Fauci fired and who are trying to gin up the controversy and the antagonism between the president and Dr. Fauci. And the reason is because they want Fauci fired because of his competence. See, there are members of the media who do not believe any competent person should surround the president. They want the president to fail. And the best way to get the president to fail is to surround him with idiots who will give him bad advice as opposed to people like Dr. Fauci who are steering him in the right direction. Look, for example, look, for example, if you will, at the media antagonism of Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo, former congressman from Kansas, is now the secretary of state, and he's doing a really good job. And the media is livid with Pompeo for doing a good job, and they're out to undermine him. Notice the media never really antagonistically tried to undermine Rex Tillerson. In fact, the media spent a lot of time building Tillerson up because Tillerson wasn't a very good secretary of state. And they're out to get Pompeo because of his competence. They're out to get Fauci for his competence. They're out to get Burks for her competence. It's like the media was out to get Nikki Haley. You see how the media, when Nikki Haley was the UN ambassador, they did their best to try to drive a wedge. They ran all sorts of hit jobs on Nikki Haley. She's antagonizing members of the Trump administration. Nikki Haley's acting like she's president. They did it with uh, Mike Pence as well. The media ran those stories about Mike Pence. People think Mike Pence is more the president than the president. Behind the scenes, people know Mike Pence is really the power behind the throne. And Mike Pence whispers in the president's ears and pulls his puppet strings. And it was they were media hit jobs designed to make the president not trust the competent people giving him advice. And to his credit, the president continued to listen to him. To his credit, the president defended them. To his credit, the president kept them in their positions. To his credit, the president has kept people like Fauci and Burks in their positions. I understand why the president's supporters can't bring themselves to blame the president, even though they should if they were honest about it, and why they're making Fauci the bad guy. They shouldn't be doing that.
They should be honest. But I understand why the media is doing it, and I'm really disturbed by the media doing it because the media wants competence out of this White House. If you will recall, when this president became president, there was a concerted effort in the media to shame anyone who decided to work for him. People were open about it. There were progressive activists openly shaming people. In fact, there's an ongoing effort where when you leave the Trump administration, if anyone in the media outside of Fox dares to give you a contract, they will shame those media outlets into not. Look at what happened with What's-Her-Name, who were, it was in the Justice Department and went over to CNN to work behind the scenes to help gear up coverage for 2020. And they were horrified. She's now a, a contributor on CNN. She got hired by the dispatch. What is her name? Uh, nice girl, too. Um, but um, the the media, the media and partisans in the media drove her out of a job in the media because she had worked for Donald Trump. We're going to see this, by the way, if he were to lose in 2020 or even if he wins and, and, he lo- and he's out in 2024 because he's term limited, you're going to see people in the media blackball anyone who worked for Donald Trump. They want to shame anyone who works for him who's competent to get him out so he's only surrounded by incompetence, and they want to punish anyone who dared have the audacity to not walk away from him. Every single person, regardless of your politics, should be disturbed by that. Every single one of you should be disturbed by an ongoing media effort. It is not a partisan progressive effort, although it is, but the media, the objective members of the media, the presumed objective members of the media, they may lie about their objectivity, but they're given that veneer. And they are the ones who are trying to make a rift between the president and Dr. Fauci. And we're all worse off because of it. We need a media in this country we can actually believe And I don't know that we have one, and that should trouble all of us. I got to tell you, you know what? One of the remarkable things about having a talk radio show, the number of pitches you get from people, like, for example, there is an adult toy manufacturer who would like to come on this program to talk to you guys about the rise in purchases during COVID-19. There is another person whose who's pitch I just got who would like to come on and talk about uh, how you can get ready for a new job after you've lost your job. Uh, and this person is, is making her own pitch. I, I, I every day. And then the cannabis people. Do you know how many um, marijuana manufacturers want to get on talk radio now? And I'm just on the distribution list. And you can see all sorts of people cop- copied. And they, they want to come on conservative radio and talk about marijuana. Um, and, and adult toys and losing your job. And, and my favorite is the dog trainer. Last week I got one from a dog trainer who wanted to come on that. And the basic pitch was you're stuck at home right now, so you should use his online course to learn how to train your dog. And if you don't have a dog, you should get a dog. By the way, as an aside, Philip and I were having this conversation this morning. You see the craziest stuff uh, in the morning uh, when you're out and about. Uh, the number of people I see in my neighborhood who I had no idea they've got more dogs than relatives. I passed a guy this morning, and maybe he was walking someone else's dogs as well. He could have been, but he had like five dogs that he was walking. Like, how how do you have in your house that many dogs? I know people who do, and I love pet. We've got we've got a, a golden doodle. I like cats. I like dogs, but having that many, I, I've got a friend of mine who now has has four kids and has more dogs than kids in the house. And every year or so is having to change out furniture because the dogs destroy the furniture. Why? Why? Come on now. Don't do that. In any event, I digress. There's other stuff we need to talk about out there, isn't there? Yes, there is, Uh, including, hang on a second. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? This. I want to play this audio for you. I will not comment on this audio until I have played this audio. You need to hear the audio. I was, as many people know, I was a very strong supporter of Senator Sanders. And uh, Senator Sanders believes very much that this is something that, um, that in a direction that he wants to take the campaign and wants to make sure that we position uh, progressive leaders as um, in very key positions to, at the very least, sway and push the Biden administration as much as possible um, to improve and better articulate progressive policy. Um. Okay. Um. I, I gotta. I would just like to say that having Alexandria Ocasio Cortez out there for Joe Biden is going to hurt Joe Biden. 
And I, I just, I, okay. How do I do this? Okay, okay, okay. Um, here you go. I think, so when I, when I ran campaigns, we would have people, and you know the people. Let's, let's just be honest. There are people who don't have the self-awareness to understand how they'll be viewed by other people. Like, I'm always concerned how people are going to take me and stuff. Um, are, are people just telling me stuff because um, because they're they're trying to, to flatter me because of who I am and they don't really mean it? They think I'm a jerk. I'm, I, 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 got, I got all those, those self-confidence problems. I'll, I'll be honest with you. But I, I see people, when I, when I ran campaigns, there would always be the, be the person who didn't have the awareness to realize that they probably should not be front and center. Oh, if you've ever walked and worked in politics, you know the people. You do. And you just need to be real honest that such people do exist. And you got to tread carefully because you don't want to upset them because they're good people, they're sweet people, they've got kind spirits, and they could they could work on the campaign, but they just don't really need to be the face of the campaign. And Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is kind of like that. They're going to give her a role and hope you never see her again. And she is, she lacks the self-awareness to understand that. And you know, she's going to be vocal because the media loves her. She's a celebrity and she scares the bejesus out of pretty much everybody who's not a communist. And she is hurting in her reelection campaign already. She may lose a reelection. She doesn't have the self-awareness to realize she and her crazy policies scare a whole lot of people. And Joe Biden has put her in a position, and they're going to give her a title, and basically they want her to be an envelope stuffer in the back of the uh, back of the building. And she's thinking, no, uh, my title is Green New Deal Czar. Uh, by God, I'm going to go out there and be a czar. And she's going to do damage to the campaign. She is. And they don't realize it, which just makes it all the more hilarious to watch. I would be remiss if I didn't note again that today I'm going to break in my Rec Tech grill. And that means I got my Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce and I'm going to go cook with it. Old school Southern barbecue. You should get Mrs. Griffin's barbecue sauce. I realize I'm only supposed to plug them once a show and I already have and I'm going to do it again. Why? Because I'm going to go use my Rec Tech. Now, I did not realize so many of you have them. I've had so many of you reach out and say you got them instead of a Traeger as well. They're not even a show sponsor, and I feel like I should make them one just, just for free because I'm I'm so excited. I got chicken breast and I got a brisket. So I'm going to do my chicken breast, and then I'm going to do my brisket, and we're going to have good eats, and I'm going to tell you all about it tomorrow, and you are warned. Charlie's probably not even going to show up for work tomorrow because of it. <laughs> 